All right, our last PowerPoint on bacteria. So we had an entire lecture all about gram-negative bacteria, an entire lecture all on gram-positive bacteria. And this final lecture, which is not as long, uh, is what we call our unusual bacteria. And they are all gram-negative, but they're either unusual in their size, they're unusual in their shape, they're unusual in some fashion, but they are all gram-negative. Uh, and we group them into four different groups. The rickettsias, the chlamydias, the spirochetes, and the vibrios. And we're going to go through them in that particular order. If I can get my clicker to work, that would be awesome. So in the rickettsia group, we're going to talk about three different bacteria. In the chlamydias, we're going to focus mostly on one, but we'll talk about two others that can cause disease. Um, in the Spire Creek group, we're going to focus on two of them. And in the Vibrio, we're going to talk about three of them. Again, these are the most common bacteria that cause disease in these groups. Um, there are more bacteria in these groups that we don't talk about that are rarer. Uh, but these are the ones that you may have experience with sometime in your lifetime, or in some of them, you may have already had experience with them. And you're like, oh, really? Yes. Um, some of them, if you've not had experience with some of these, you will have known someone that has had experience with some of them, I guarantee it. So our very first group, the rickettsia group, uh, which includes our rickettsia, our ehrlichia, and our anaplasma bacteria that are in this one group. So the rickettsia actually gets, you know, the name of rickettsia for the group. But they're all in this group mostly because of their size. They're extremely small. They're almost down to the virus type size. So our microscopes magnifying them a thousand times, they're going to be like the tiniest, tiniest little specks that it's still going to be extremely hard to see. They also appear wall-less. They have very little peptidoglycan. And I know they're already gram-negative, which means they already have a thin cell wall. Well, these guys have almost no peptidoglycan whatsoever, which means they sometimes can change shape a little bit because their wall is so thin um, they can't always maintain an exact shape. And they are all obligate intracellular parasites. And so they like to get inside of our cells and then feed off of our cells. They want to live off of our cells, because why not? <coughs> and it's because of them living inside of our cells, this is where they're going to cause all of their damage. And so the first one in here is the Rickettsia rickettsii is the actual bacteria name, and it causes the disease known as Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. It is spread by hard ticks, because there's soft ticks, there's hard ticks, there's tons of tons of ticks. Um, luckily for us, I'm going to say it's like a dog tick. Ooh, hold on, I want to say the names of the ticks. Um, there's an American dog tick, a Rocky Mountain wood tick, those are the, oh, a brown dog tick, a cayenne tick, like there's several tick species that can carry this particular bacteria. Luckily for us, most of them are not found in, this lo in our location. Um, most. Uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, although it's called Rocky Mountains, it's really not, the number, most number of cases are really not in the Rockies. Um, they're a little more south of here is where we have the, the highest number of cases. We have had cases here in Wisconsin. The majority of the cases we have in Wisconsin is because someone traveled and then picked it up. But it was in 2018, and I don't know if this link is going to work anymore. Uh, we had kind of our first big jewel. Uh, we had our first big case here in La Crosse County in 2018 that someone had picked up this particular bacteria from a tick. They were camping down in Goose Island. Um, and it, one of the very first symptoms is that it causes a rash on your trunk and your appendages. But there's so many things that can cause rashes. I mean, if you go camping and all of a sudden you have a rash, you're like, oh my goodness, I got into poison ivy or, you know, something irritating, um, that it went misdiagnosed or undiagnosed for a long period of time. And this individual did eventually die of it. Uh, if they could have gotten diagnosed earlier, I can't guarantee for sure you know, she'd survive, but she probably would have had... Um, a lot better chance of survival. So there are cases around here, but it's extremely rare. Um, but the biggest reason is why it causes so much damage and what causes the rash is that 
These are intracellular parasites, and the cells they like to get into are the ones that line our blood vessel walls. And as they live in the, the cells that line our blood vessel walls, they kill the cells, which causes those little blood vessels to, to start to burst. And part of that rash is like little bursting blood vessels as you've got breaking blood vessels and capillaries all over. Now, it's treatable. We do have antibiotics that can treat it again. The sooner, the better for diagnosis. Um, this is, they actually took a picture. These are all the blood vessels themselves um, and the cells that line the blood vessels. All the dark pink are the bacteria that are just thriving in the capillary areas. So they really like to get into those blood vessel walls and cause lots and lots of damage. Other bacteria that are also spread by ticks uh, that we also still have around here um, that are still in the Rickettsia group because of their size is an Ehrlichia and an Anoplasma. And the top two bacteria in those genus that cause our diseases, Ehrlichia shafiensis and uh, the Anoplasma phagocytophila, which up and you're like, oh, yeah, that's a horrible long word. But actually, the word itself just tells us what it likes. You know, it's got that fill in there, so it likes something. And it likes to get eaten. That's the, ph the, the phagocyte. Um, it likes to get eaten by those phagocytic cells. Because again, these are intracellular parasites, so it can get eaten. And then it just lives inside that cell. Uh, so it's a long word, but it really just tells you exactly what this bacteria is doing. Now, based on the map up there, which of these do we have here in Wisconsin? and Minnesota, and Illinois, but we don't have any information for Iowa because I don't know what's going on there. And we got both. Um, so we do have cases of Ehrlichia and Chaffeeensis anal and Anoplasma. Uh, they're both spread by ticks. This includes the deer tick. And Anoplasma phag phagocytophilum, I wouldn't be surprised if sometime in your careers you will have experienced someone that comes in with this particular disease. Um, it is more common than Ehrlichia's, and it's the second most common tick spread disease in our area. And we're going to talk today about the number one tick causes disease, uh, but this is the number two one that's found in our area. So still not extremely common. There's usually a couple cases a year, so you know, whether that's your patient or not, I'm not sure. Um, here is another one. This is the 2017 map, the number of cases of Ehrlichia and Anaplasma. Again, we have a few cases every year, um, but they're around. But the farther north you go, you know, you go out into the woods areas more. I don't know why their cases seem to go up so much more. Um, more agriculture, more woods, there's more cases um, the farther north you go. Now, the Ehrlichia and the Anoplasma, again, they like to get eaten. They are intracellular parasites. And so they do have three developmental stages in those white blood cells that eat them. The first is the elementary body. That's right after it gets eaten. And then it leaves that little phagosome, that little protective shell, after it got eaten. And it then turns into what's known as the initial body. This is when it starts to reproduce, because that's what bacteria like to do. But it's still, the more it reproduces, the more it will trigger that cell, like, hey, there's something going on here. You should probably try to kill me. And so after it starts to reproduce, it will then trigger itself to go into a, a self-made protective shell, and it will reproduce inside of that. And that's when it's called a marula. Um, it's just this little, little protective shell that lives inside. We can actually see some of them inside of the, our own white blood cells. And then our white blood cells do absolutely nothing for it. And the bacteria will reproduce, and then they'll get released. And our white blood cells that are supposed to protect us from all the stuff um, actually become a bacteria factory. It's treatable, though. We do have quite a few different antibiotics that can kill the bacteria without causing us any issues. But the best prevention, since it's spread by ticks, is don't get bitten by ticks. You know, in the summer times, that's the the one good thing about me being like 30 degrees for a high on Friday, sorry if you didn't realize that, uh, is that the ticks start to go away in the winter. So people that hate the winter months, at least we don't have to worry about all these tick and mosquito things because we haven't really even gotten to mosquito diseases. Most of those are the viruses coming up. Um, so it's like a few months of just, we don't have to worry about going outside. 
second group, so we're in our second of our four groups already, our second group of our unusual bacteria are the chlamydias. Again, also in this group, they are extremely tiny, and they don't even have a cell wall at all. So we can't even say like, oh, they just have a really thin cell wall. They just have zero cell wall. They still have two cell membranes. They are still technically gram-negative bacteria. And they also are parasites of our cells, but specifically energy parasites. So they will get inside of our cells and they steal the ATP that our cells make. Our cells are constantly making ATP in our mitochondria and it's used in lots of different things inside the cells and throughout the body. Well, these bacteria get in there and they steal all the ATP. They do have the machinery to make their own ATP, but they would rather steal our ATP. So we call them energy parasites. And it also is found in two forms. One is called the elementary bodies, and these are dormant bacteria, but they are the infective form. So if you're gonna pick up a chlamydia bacteria, you're gonna pick up an elementary body. And then once it gets into your body, then it kind of wakes itself up and starts to reproduce. So these elementary bodies are almost like kind of like an endospore where they go dormant, but they're not protected like an endospore. Uh, but they go dormant and they're just ready to get into a host. Once they get into a host, they're called the reticulate bodies where they actually are starting to grow and divide. And so an elementary body is gonna be a lot smaller. The reticulate body is where the bacteria are actually growing and reproducing, and then they'll burst and spread uh, throughout the body. And again, there are multiple chlamydias that we're gonna talk about, but we're gonna focus on the most common one that causes disease, uh, which is gonna be the chlamydia trachomatis. But this is just to show you those elementary bodies and the reticular bodies. The elementary body, that tiny little red circle, again, they're gram-negative, um, is the infective. It attaches to a cell, it gets inside the cell, and now it becomes active because it's found itself a wonderful little home, and it becomes that reticular body when it starts to reproduce. Again, it reproduces, makes lots of bacteria. Those bacteria get released from the cell, and they go and find more cells. Chlamydia trachomatis is, uh, or the chlamydia trachomatis is the most common chlamydia, to the point where most people just, oh, chlamydia. Like, oh, but there's lots of chlamydia out there that can cause disease. Again, we're going to talk about three of them. Um, but this is the most common one that people would generally talk about. So they just usually leave off the species of the trachomatis. Gets into the body through any type of abrasion. So it gets in past the skin. So if there's any type of cut, any type of scratch, anything, anywhere where it can get in, it will get in. But it can also get in through the conjunctiva of the eye, because we're going to talk about causes a ton of eye diseases. And it can get into various mucous membranes, including those in the reproductive tract. It is the number one reportable STD in the United States. And I didn't get a chance to look up to see what La Crosse County's numbers are. The last time I looked it up, um, like a year ago, um, the La Crosse County reports over 500 cases a year um, of chlamydia trachomatis in La Crosse County. Um, the majority of those are in the city of La Crosse, because it's La Crosse County. And of those that are in La Crosse County, the majority of them are focused right around the campuses of UWL, Western, and Viterbo, the college students. Now, all the clinical manifestations of this disease are all due to the fact that they get inside the cells and they're gonna cause damage as they're feeding off of our cells. And all the damages, uh, or all the clinical manifestations, all the outward symptoms, which I get into on my next slide, um, are all due to cell destruction and inflammation where those bacteria are doing damage. And because you'll see pictures coming up, because I can get into that conjunctiva of the eye, it does cause a ton of eye infections. It's not just uh, only reproductive tract infections. There's so many of these like, little funny names about chlamydia. Friends don't give friends chlamydia. It was hard to like pick and choose. So some of them are scattered around. If it gets in, if it gets in through um, sexually, uh, any type of sexual intercourse, we consider it a sexually transmitted disease. If it gets into the eye through that conjunctiva of the eye, it's considered an ocular disease and we call the condition known as a trachoma. 
So if it is spread through any type of sexual intercourse, um, some of the outcomes or symptoms that you're going to have, one, it's called non-gonococcal urethritis. So it just means it's not a, um, it's not gonorrhea. Talk about that. I don't know where you talked about that. It was in the intro video. Um, but it causes inflammation of the urethra, which means you're going to have painful urination. So it causes inflammation of the urethra. It's going to hurt and be very, very painful every time you urinate, which is generally the main thing that sends individuals to the doctor that there's something going on. But it does also cause inflammation and um, enlargement of the lymph nodes near the infection site. And because we do have very large lymph nodes right in our groin area, those are going to become very enlarged, very inflamed, um, lots of inflammation. Um, it's going to be painful. And that's the lymphogranuloma venereum. Long. It's the lymph inflammation of the lymph nodes. <laughs> It can also cause proctitis and pelvic inflammatory disease. So proctitis is pretty much inflammation of anywhere in the groin, um, all the way to the anal opening, any inflammation there. So it's going to be red, painful, and inflamed. And pelvic inflammatory disease is when it can get up inside the pelvic region. And in women, this can lead to sterility. If it gets in and causes damage to the fallopian tubes or any part of the eustachian tubes, well, that's the same thing. Um, what is the other word? I was going to say the uterus. I was going to say like any, any part of the female reproductive tract. It can cause inflammation and possibly lead to sterility. Again, it can get into the eyes. Now, this is not a very common symptom for adults. It's more common with infants. If mom has chlamydia, it's not diagnosed, she's not treated, and she goes through childbirth, those infants will pick up that bacteria from the reproductive tract and get it into their eyes. It's one of the reasons, uh, it's one of the bacteria that can cause serious eye infections in infants, which is why literally within minutes after infants are born, antibiotic creams are put into their eyes. Um, not just for this one, there's other bacteria they can pick up as well. And those eyes are very sensitive for bacteria to get in. Now, what this bacteria will do to the eyelids, it will cause the eyelids to turn inside out. And if left long enough, it can actually, it will start to scrape and cause permanent damage to the eyelids. And it causes what's known as non-traumatic blindness, which means you will go blind. And it's not because, you know, you got a stick in your eye or some other traumatic event. It was just a disease that caused that slow damage to your eyes. Um, you're also going to have lots and lots of pus and inflammation. Again, you do have a bacterial infection in your eyes. Um, it is treatable. Again, we do have lots of antibiotics that can treat it. Um, and if, if it's bad enough, they may have to surgically um, manipulate that eyelid so it doesn't keep causing damage. How we diagnose someone with chlamydia trachomatis is... One, we can look specifically for the bacteria. They do fluoresce, or we can add a fluorescent antibody stain to them. And then we can easily look underneath the microscope. We can see which cells they've gotten into, because the cells are going to start to glow. We can also do molecular testing, which is usually just a whole lot faster. We just look for the DNA of the bacteria. Again, it's treatable. The top antibiotic that's usually prescribed is erythromycin. If the eyelids are affected enough, they might have to surgically correct those eyelids. It's bad is just to not get in in the first place. So uh, since most cases are spread through sexual intercourse, prevention, abstinence, monogamy, and condoms will all help slow or stop the spread. But it's here. It's in lacrosse. This is not like, oh, if I travel. No, it's here in lacrosse. I gotta have to look up to see what lacrosse's current numbers are at. I think it was like two years ago, there was maybe or maybe before COVID. Um, there was like a huge rise in number of cases. I don't know what's going on? It's not the only chlamydia that causes disease. Again, there's two other chlamydias that cause disease that are in this group. The one's called chlamydia pneumoniae. 
And yes, it can cause pneumonias. About 10% of all pneumonias are caused by this particular bacteria. And everyone's like, oh my god, you can get pneumonia from, from chlamydia? Yeah, but it's not the same chlamydia uh, that's associated with STDs. So it's completely different bacteria. It's just called chlamydia pneumoniae. And it causes about 5% of all bronchitis and sinus infection cases as well. So it's, I was going to say, most of the time, it just causes like a mild, you know, your tired cough type of symptom. So it gets in and affects the respiratory tract, but it normally just causes mild symptoms. A lot of times you wouldn't even get diagnosed. They might just give you an antibiotic without ever um, IDing it down to this particular bacteria. And the third chlamydia that causes issues is called chlamydia cytosy. And this one is spread from birds, whether it's wild birds or pet birds, and it causes flu-like symptoms. So people that ha handle birds, interact with birds, own birds as pets, are at an increased risk of picking up this particular chlamydia bacteria. And this is always one too, I know most of you are going into the nursing, um, this is one is like, if you're chatting with your patients and you're like, oh, you own birds? You know, like those little things are kind of like clues, you know, if they're experiencing some type of flu-like symptoms and they're like, I don't know, your flu test came back negative, you know, what else could it be? Oh, you have birds. Well, we could test you for this. Um, it's transmitted by, you know, just hanging out with the birds, air cells, uh, um, if the bird sneezes on you, they sneeze. Um, or just if you're in um, contact with the bird itself or any of their material, they can pick it up. Again, it's not super common. We do have a few cases around here in La Crosse County every year, but um, it, most of the time it probably isn't even diagnosed because it's flu-like symptoms. You probably think you have the flu, um, and most people will heal just fine without any type of antibiotic treatment. But it's other chlamydias that are not the sexually transmitted one. Our third of our four groups are the spirochetes. These is, you know, that third shape of bacteria that we're just not going to look at in lab. And so they have a helical shape to it, meaning they have kind of that old telephone cord helical shape to it. And they can actually move in like a helical or corkscrew fashion, which means they can twist and burrow in, just like a wine bottle opener as it twists and goes in. They can move through tissues and through the body that way as well. Now, the top two genera of bacteria that cause disease that are in this group, and again, there's still other genera. Uh, these are just the top two that you probably have heard of, um, are the treponema and Borrelia. And most of the time, you're like, I've never heard of those before. You have, though, because although you never hear about the actual bacteria names, you have heard of both of them for their diseases that they cause. So uh, the treponema causes, specifically treponema pallidum pallidum, it gets two species names, I don't know why. Uh, treponema pallidum pallidum, probably never heard of it, but you've probably heard of syphilis before. So again, most people don't know the bacteria names, they just know the diseases that these bacteria cause. So syphilis is caused by this bacteria. It only infects humans, so this is not a bacteria that we can pick up by any contact with humans or with animals, and it does not survive in animals. It actually is just really hard to grow at all, even in lab situations. But the bacteria, if left untreated, can progress through three different phases. The very first phase that this bacteria causes it's called primary syphilis is where we end up with canker sores. So we end up with painful lesions usually at the infection site, and they are usually a sexually transmitted bacteria. So there's usually lesions anywhere on the reproductive area. Probably going to send you to the doctor. But, you know, as we go through, through, through the three phases, we're going to assume the person didn't go to, through the doctor and get treated. And if left untreated, about six to eight weeks later, that bacteria, again, it's in our body, it's causing damage, and it is spreading throughout the cardiovascular system, it will cause a full widespread body rash. And it will stay like that for several weeks. Again, we're going to assume that probably would send someone to the doctor, but we're still going to assume someone was not treated. 
And if left untreated, it's usually in this stage where it causes that full body rash, that people that do have a healthy working immune system, at some point in there, your body will get rid of the bacteria itself. And we go into kind of this little intermediate stage called just a dormant stage, where the bacteria has now been killed by your immune system. You didn't take any antibiotics. Your immune system killed the bacteria. However, that bacteria, because it hung out and did so much damage to your cells um, throughout the entire body, later on, whether it's a year later, whether it's five years later, it can turn into what's known as tertiary syphilis. And the, the nerves anywhere in the central nervous system, anywhere in the cardiovascular system, the effects of that damage from the bacteria being in that body for weeks, that damage starts to become evident. Um, one of the things that can start to show up are these, they're called gumas. It says they're painful lesions. I don't know, that looks really painful. Um, but we end up with lesions on our skin. We can end up with lesions on our bone. Um, that's just due to the nerve damage that those bacteria cause. We can end up with any type of nervous system issues later on in life, any type of heart or cardiovascular issues later on in life. It means your nervous system and your heart were affected. They were infected and attacked by bacteria for weeks, and although you might be really healthy now, you can handle a little bit of damage, but later on as your whole body just goes downhill, this becomes very evident. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As long as you have a working immune system, your immune system should be able to get rid of it. But it's like weeks, if not months later. And then, so I remember, I don't know if this was like way back in the day, but does syphilis still cause like, um, mm -hmm. uh, generally no, unless it causes like later on in life. But right when you're first infected with it, no. But like later on, yes, nervous system, like Middle, Middle Eastern times type or, you know, medieval times. Um, again, right away, no. But later on, yeah, as it affects the nervous system, it could cause you to have nervous system issues, including probably going a little bit crazy. And before we had any type of antibiotic treatments, like people did the weirdest type of treatments to get rid of it. They would do, you know... Um, releasing blood from the body and taking, um, I think they would take or drink um, mercury. Um, <laughs> that's going to cause a whole lot of other issues as well. Um, you know, I'm like, is it again? No, we didn't have antibiotics. We just, you know, everyone tried anything to try to get rid of it. Now, it is mostly spread through sexual contact. And so the endemic populations that usually are at the, high, the highest number of cases of syphilis, um, anyone that's in prostitution, but because it is found and spreads in the cardiovascular system, any type of needle drug use can spread this particular bacteria as well. Now, yeah, and it can cause issues, especially if left untreated, but one of the biggest complications that can happen with people that have syphilis is if a woman has syphilis and she's pregnant, this bacteria can cross the placental barrier and it can cause something known as congenital syphilis. Um, it can cause severe malformations of a fetus. It can cause death, but it can also cause severe malformations. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm like, I found this picture where I'm like, you know, this poor individual's faces, I mean, they've got infection, you know, little pustules all over, but. The face itself could be very malformed um, in infants. I just saw something this morning, too, um, about, it was a picture, and they're like, oh, this came from congenital syphilis, that like an entire tibia, like, as an adult, was completely malformed and bent. And that was because they were born that way. If you Google congenital syphilis, the pictures are very disturbing to the point I couldn't put them on the PowerPoint, um, because it causes just such severe physical malformations in infants. Now, healthcare workers can be at a higher elevated risk of picking it up because, again, you're going to have patients that are coming in, they're sick, they may have this particular bacteria, and if you have any contact with lesions and you're not wearing your proper PPE, you're putting yourself at risk of picking up different bacteria. So wear proper PPE. The incidence of adult syphilis in the United States is going down. Um, Mostly that's just because of antibiotic use and information out there. 
And it was funny because someone in one of my classes, they're like, what's going on in northern Alaska? <laughs> I don't I don't know. <laughs> I mean, all of you know, California doesn't look either. I'm like, I don't know. I don't even think that many people live in northern Alaska. Um, and even in there, you know, lacrosse doesn't even look like it's got any cases. We do. It's just not apparently as high um, as other areas in the state or in other states. Now, how we diagnose it, we can uh, do a blood draw in this bacteria is found in the plasma portion of the blood. So we can separate out the plasma from the blood, and then we can stain them. And we can easily see these long spirochete bacteria living in the plasma of someone that's infected. We can also add some fluorescent antibodies to them, make them glow underneath the microscope. But we run into issues diagnosing someone with tertiary syphilis. Because in tertiary syphilis, there is no bacteria anymore. Like your body got rid of it, you know, after secondary syphilis. So tertiary syphilis, we can't use these to diagnose because no bacteria are there. So for tertiary syphilis to diagnose, we just have to go back on patient past history. Ah, we see that you had, you know, a rash that you came in for, and apparently they didn't diagnose them. Or they have to ask the patient lots of questions like, oh, did you ever have syphilis? Did you ever have lesions? Did you ever have this widespread rash that didn't go away for a while? Was that a few years ago? You know, they have to go back on patient past history to do a diagnosis of tertiary syphilis. Treatment, penicillin is like the antibiotic of choice. Um, it is the most effective to the point that even people that are allergic to penicillin are even still given small enough doses of penicillin not to cause severe allergic reactions, but they're usually still given small enough doses because it's such an effective antibiotic for this particular bacteria. Because the number one way it's spread is through sexual intercourse, prevention, abstinence, monogamy, um, and condoms will all help slow or stop the spread. And then our second of our spirochete group is the Borrelia. Again, most people are like, nope, never heard of Borrelia. Most people haven't even heard the actual full bacteria name, Borrelia burgdorferi, but I think you've all probably heard of the disease that Borrelia burgdorferi causes, which is Lyme's disease. Is that around here? Yeah. Has anyone diagnosed with Lyme's disease in here? Like, sometimes I have students that have had, but I'm normally everyone in here, does everyone know someone that's been diagnosed with Lyme's disease? I was going to say, in this area, it's almost hard not to. <laughs> Um, so it's still gram negative. Everything in this uh, PowerPoint is, and it has that spirochete look to it. Again, this is why we don't work with these bacteria in our lab. I don't want to work with Lyme's disease bacteria in our lab, like active bacteria. I also don't want to work with syphilis bacteria in our lab either. So we don't work with them in our lab this semester. Um, but Lyme's disease, the Borrelia burgdorferi, is the actual bacteria that causes Lyme's disease. So some people don't even realize until this class uh, that Lyme's disease is caused by a bacteria. They're just like, I don't know, a tick gave it to me. <laughs> oh, but is it a virus? Thank you. What is it? Um, it's a bacteria, and it is spread through ticks um, in the Ixodes genus, specifically deer ticks in our area. Now, I know a little bit about the tick life cycle, and I'm one of those, I'm not going to lie, I hate ticks. Like, I mean, I hate spiders, but I, like, I hate ticks anymore. I like freak out when I see them. So I don't even like talking about ticks and like showing pictures of ticks, but here we go. It's my job. Um, now, the good thing about ticks is that when eggs are laid by a tick, they are uninfected. So at least we start off fresh. And those eggs are going to hatch into larvae, usually in the spring. And those larvae, as soon as they hatch, they're hungry. But again, they're not infected yet because they were just born. So they start to feed on small things that scurry around, and it's those animals that was where they pick up the bacteria. The ticks had to pick it up from somewhere. Everyone's like, oh, they picked it up from a deer. Well, that's not the only thing that these ticks can feed off of. They can feed off deer, and they do really do prefer deer, but they will start to feed off other, bac or other animals, and when they feed, they pick up the bacteria, and once that bacteria gets in there, it just starts to multiply because that's what bacteria do. It's not going to cause any issues in the ticks themselves. They're just hosts where the bacteria is reproducing. 
And those larvae, as soon as they pick up the bacteria, and that bacteria is multiplying throughout the whole summer, um, they, as they start to grow, they can bite individuals and spread it. The good news is larvae are usually pretty small, and the bite of a larva usually has very few bacteria, that it's not likely to cause a full-blown Lyme's disease infection. But the issue is that larvae are almost microscopic, like it's almost impossible to see them. So it's possible to pick it up from larva, but rare. But as the bacteria grow, um, they go throughout the summer, it's multiplying like crazy, they'll go through the fall and the winter, and they don't die as much as like we're outside and we're not getting eaten by ticks. As we get into freezing cold weathers, the ticks are, they're not dead, they've gone dormant. Um, and they go throughout the winter and the bacteria are still just reproducing slowly because bacteria don't like freezing cold temperatures. And by the time we get into the next spring, they've grown large enough and so they're a little more visible is what's known as a, a nymph. And nymph, come spring, they haven't eaten all winter, they're hungry and they're going to be latching onto pretty much anything that moves that's warm, whether it's an animal or whether it's you guys. Um, and nymph are very, very small, even smaller than that. Um, so you can see the size, this is, this is a dime. Um, so you know how small a dime is and then larvae are that tiny, like, you know, the inside of the D on a dime. Um, nymph are a little larger, still extremely tiny. And then you get into the adults, which are a little more visible. They are hungry. And it's this second spring slash summer, the nymphs, as they start to feed um, and spread the bacteria, they are also developing into adults. And it's where they can start to lay eggs and start the whole process again. So the very first summer of a tick is usually not very infectious to humans because um, it's just when they're picking the bacteria up. It's that second summer when the nymph, which are really tiny and hard to see, um, are biting and spreading the bacteria and the adults are also biting and spreading the bacteria and laying eggs and starting the whole process all over again. Yay for Disease. Ah, the signs and symptoms have a huge variety, which makes it difficult for some people to identify the bacteria. So one of the symptoms is a bullseye's rash at the bite site of the tick. So people will usually know if they've been bitten by a tick, but Always, sometimes the tick bites and then it comes off and they never even saw it. Um, but a bullseye's rash at the bite site. But only about 30% of people actually get the bullseye rash. So some people are like, oh, I don't know, I got bitten by a tick, but I didn't get a rash, so I'm sure I'm fine. Um, not everyone gets that bite site, that bullseye rash that's super characteristic of the bacteria. Um, other people, they will have trouble sleeping. It starts to get in and affect the nervous system. Um, they'll have trouble sleeping. They will have um, pain in their joints because this bacteria really likes to congregate and cause inflammation of the joints. So a lot of people, they'll wake up and they're like, oh my God, my arm just can't move and it's like super inflamed or their knees will swell up. Um, we're just showing in this picture. Um, and because it causes just inflammation around the joints and the fluid to build up there. I know I listed a whole bunch. I can't remember all my symptoms. Looking them up. Oh, tired, dizzy, stiff, that's because of the muscle, night aches, can't concentrate, um, irritable, some people have ringing in the ears, um, night sweats, I don't know, a ton of different symptoms, which again can make it hard to diagnose. And for a lot of individuals, well, they'll just go undiagnosed for a long period of time. So again, you know, it can go through three phases if left untreated. So again, we do try to look for that bullseye's rash, but if you were, you know, bitten by a tick on your, you know, on your scalp, how are you going to see the bullseye's rash with your hair in the way? Um, and some people don't even get it anyways. Then you start to look at other weird random symptoms. But if left untreated, not taking any antibiotics, it can get into what's known as the early disseminated stage, which starts to cause neurological symptoms. Um, it can cause individuals to, to almost look like they're having a stroke um, as it starts to cause, you know, 
problems with that nervous system. It can cause cardiac dysfunction. People will start to have arrhythmias, um, all caused by this bacteria that's causing damage in the body. And then if left still untreated, still never got any type of antibiotic treatment, um, it can cause severe arthritis that will last your entire lifetime. It generally is not a deadly bacteria. I myself have never heard of anyone even dying of this, but I would say if someone already had heart issues, you know, this could be the thing that tips them over the edge. Um, but it in itself, uh, all by itself, generally doesn't cause death. But I don't know if I want, you know, horrible neurological symptoms. Um, one of our other instructors, she was telling me too, they live out in the country. Her husband started having neurological symptoms that the doctor was like, well, you know, you might have a brain tumor or Lyme's disease. Oh, but we won't find out. Neurological symptoms were almost characteristics of a brain tumor um, or a bacterial infection that's easily treatable. Um, so it can cause issues. She was mad. What? Really? Oh, I've never heard. All right, Logan, but why is it that guys wait so long to go to? Um, yeah. Um, why? Why? Why, Logan? That's <laughs> They're a little, I don't know. Like, he's fine. Ah, a couple of weeks ago, my dog had a tick on it. Luckily, she's very light colored. I was able to see my it right dog, away. My dog had a tick on her cheek, but it was just crawling. And I was, she was looking at me and she's talking to me. And I was like, don't move. Oh my gosh. No one that freaks out if there's a tick in me. I'm like, go, go. I hate ticks. I mean, well, maybe not luckily. The, the easy, so I should, maybe it's not lucky whatsoever. So deer ticks are the smaller ticks. So if you've got a really big tick on you and you're like, wow, look at that huge tick. It's not a deer tick. It's a wood tick, which are very, very common around here. We have them in our backyard. We keep treating for it, though, and they've gone away, um, or almost. Um, deer tick are a lot smaller. So they would almost look like the larva of a wood tick. So they're harder to see. So if you're like, oh my God, it's a huge tick, you know, or bitten by a really big tick, it's probably not a deer tick. But it does cause Lyme's disease in pets. You know, interesting side factoid, there's a Lyme's vaccine for dogs. But is there a Lyme's vaccine for humans? <laughs> no. The humans, I don't get it. Um, but I did look online, and I'm probably going to forget some of the facts, but there has been, there actually was a vaccine on the market for, I think, three years it lasted. Um, the problem is, again, you saw it on the one video, it takes a lot of money to go into any type of, you know, medical research to come up with even a vaccine. And there are a lot of cases of Lyme disease around here, and there's a lot of cases out um, in the Northeast. And actually, you know, our Lyme disease came from deer that were transplanted from Pennsylvania to us. Um, but other of the country, they've never like heard of Lyme disease. They would have no one that's ever known of Lyme disease, which means there's not a big demand to get vaccinated. Um, and so the vaccine lasted about three years. Then some people were having issues with it, reactions to it. And so, and they, of course, you know, you get to sue anyone that if you have a reaction to anything. And so they're just like, fine. And they just pulled it off the market. They're like, we're done. Um, there are some vaccines in clinical trials, though. I looked, um, but clinical trials with humans take a really long time. And I think there's like three different ones that are in clinical trials, but they're all in the very early stages. And so that means they have to like show enough progression to make it to the next stage, to make it to the next stage before it actually gets put on the market. And they're not expecting it to hit the market till maybe 2026. You know, so we do have Lyme's vaccines in trials. So maybe in the next 10 years, 
um, we'll actually see some hit the market. We'll see. I don't know. But it's just interesting that pets right now have vaccines and we don't. Now, Lyme's disease, the number of risk of cases are going up. That's not really because the bacteria are reproducing more um, or because we have more ticks. That's just because we are building out into the woods area. People are wanting, like, oh, I don't want to live in the city anymore. I'm going to build a house out in the country. Um, and not only that, they're like, oh, I want to have deer in my backyard. And then they feed deer, and the deer come in the backyard. And people are like, oh. Well, that puts them at an increased risk of developing Lyme's disease. So the number of cases are going up. To diagnose someone, again, signs and symptoms is going to be the first clue. I mean, if you go into the doctor and you're like, I was bitten by a tick, now I have a bullseye's rash, they're probably not even going to go any further than that. However, some people don't get the bullseye's rash, they never saw the bullseye's rash, and the bullseye or the bullseye rash went away, um, and now they're looking at other very random, unique um, symptoms. Because it is so common in our area, it is something that doctors are looking for. Like if you decided to you know, go out to, I don't know, Colorado or someone, and you had these different types of symptoms, they're they're not even going to be thinking about it or screening for it. The one test they can do to confirm is the Western blot test, if you remember from a couple weeks ago. This is the one where the CD says you have to have five out of the ten bands that this bacteria can show to say that, yes, you actually have Lyme's disease. Treatment, we have antimicrobial drugs, but really, the earlier you can get treated, the better. Because there are some people, if they just don't get treated right away, um, they can still have long-lasting types of arthritis or other types of symptoms that are caused by it. Um, two of our AMP instructors, both of their husbands, um, got Lyme's disease, and both of them are still suffering long-term effects from it. Best prevention, because it's spread by ticks, don't get bitten by ticks. So if you're out hiking in the summer, I always say wear light-colored clothing so that if you do have a tick on you, you can easily see it. It's not fashionable, but it's to take socks and put them on top of your pants so that they can't crawl up underneath your pants and, you know, hide out there. Um, and making sure you've got bug spray that's got the, um, the DEET in it. Um, I think they say at least 20% DEET uh, to make sure the ticks aren't biting you. One of our other, he, he used to teach a, a micro um, adjunct. His full-time job was Gunderson Lutheran research up on the fifth floor. Um, now he's one of the deans here. But um, his entire job was Lyme's disease research um, that he did for Gunderson. And so part of his job, he had to go out and walk in the woods just to try to get like ticks to land on him so that he could study. I'm like, that's the worst job in the entire world. You avoid getting ticks on me and you're like trying to get ticks on you. I'm like, Ugh, couldn't pay me enough. Um, I know it's old and outdated. This was a 2015, I don't think I had a new one. Maybe not. Um, this is just showing the number of cases of Lyme's disease in the area. I know I saw another one. I don't think, nope. um, because Monroe County is actually one of the highest counties of cases of Lyme's disease. Um, on Fort McCoy, oh, and see, Dean did all this research out there too. I want to say he said like a third of all the deer ticks in Fort McCoy all have the bacteria. Like, it's a high prevalence of number of um, infected ticks, which then puts you at a high risk of picking it up. Um, this was just showing another, you know, risk levels for Lyme disease in our area. It's just huge anywhere you go. Yay. Area are the Vibrio group. So it's a whole genus. It's a whole group. They are gram negative, they are rod shaped. However, these are the curved rod, they, that curved rod where they have kind of that little hook look to them. And they also have a flagella. And so when we see these in water, and most of them are tied to some type of water environment, we can see them, you know, move around in water. Most of them that are in this group are usually found in some type of salt water which we don't have around here, but they can still tolerate fresh water. Um, they can be found in wells. As we'll talk about one that can be found in well water. Um, so you can drink it, well water that's used on uh, agriculture. If you don't wash fruits and vegetables, you're at a risk for picking it up. 
But one of them that is mostly tied to some type of saltwater environment is Vibrio cholerae, which causes the disease cholera. So it's picked up by ingesting contaminated food or water. And this bacteria causes extreme fluid and electrolyte loss. And it's the toxin, again, and sometimes it's not the bacteria that causes the damage, a lot of times it is, but the toxin that the bacteria makes that causes the damage. My next slide will show how the, the toxin causes so much damage. Um, but the toxin will cause extreme fluid and electrolyte loss. I'm gonna get to it right now. Um, on how that toxin causes so much fluid loss. So you ingested some type of food or water that had the bacteria, it releases that toxin that looks like that, I don't know, little oval, sideways little guy. Um, and it starts to stick to the, the intestine. This is the small intestine, it's got those microvilli. So the toxin sticks to the intestinal wall lining. Part of the toxin gets inside the cells of the wall. It activates another enzyme. Um, they call it the adenocyclase, don't care. Um, but it activates something we just call it CAMP. And this is now made, and it's this particular molecule that causes chloride and sodium to go leave the cells of the small intestine and to go into the lumen of the small intestine, so the actual like inside of the intestine. And it's a little A&P review. Wherever chloride and sodium goes, water will always follow. So it's this camp molecule that this toxin causes to be released that says chloride and sodium, there's your electrolytes, leave the small intestine, water follows, now you have extreme fluid and electrolyte loss. Because once you have the electrolytes and the water leaving the cells of the small intestine going into the lumen, they're going to leave as diarrhea. Now, it is not uncommon to lose a liter of fluid an hour. So you think like a two liter bottle every two hours. Now, for us, I mean, that in itself can kill you. I mean, we can replace fluids. There's no, we don't have to go very far um, to find some type of water. I mean, we have a sink in here on random. But we am like, there's not too far we have to go to replace our fluids. The electrolyte could still kill us, though. Um, but again, we don't have to go very far, and we can get some sodium chloride, and just eat some salt, and drink some water, and you're fine. You're still going to be suffering, but you're going to be fine. But it's because of this, I'm going to go back. Ah. Uh, Electrolyte loss. The diarrhea doesn't look like diarrhea anymore. I mean, all the food is like gone. The only thing that's left that comes out of you is something known as rice water stool. Now, it's pretty much just fluids and electrolytes. Almost just like you're, you know, pooping out salt water. And they say it looks like rice water. So if you've ever made rice and you drained off the excess water, it's kind of a cloudy water look. Now you're going to think about that the next time you make rice. Um, but that's what's coming out, is all the fluids and electrolytes. Number of cases of cholera on here has not made it up here. This is found mostly in tropical regions, warm water, um, and it's usually tied to some type of original salt water source. But, my only note, it is starting to make its way north. Now, climate change, who knows, maybe it eventually will start to get cases around here. Your best bet of ever experiencing it is if you travel or if you have patients that have traveled somewhere warm and tropical and they ate some random something um, or drank random water, you may have patients that have it. But luckily, it's not here. Now, diagnosing it uh, is usually that characteristic rice water diarrhea. It's very rare that you could identify the bacteria. The bacteria are going to be lost in that water. And I mean, there's so much fluid. It's like a needle in a haystack to actually get the bacteria isolated out of there. So usually they just diagnose that rice water stool as the diagnosis. The biggest treatment is fluids and electrolyte replacement because that's what's going to kill you. I mean, you're going to be hooked up to an IV because they are replacing a liter of fluid every hour because that's what ends up killing patients is the fluids and electrolytes. They can try to do antibiotics, but most of those are lost in the body with that massive fluid and electrolyte loss. They can try to do some really strong antibiotics to try to at least get some of them to work, but sometimes the side effects of the antibiotics can almost do more harm um, than good. 
your body will eventually recover as long as you can keep replacing the fluids and electrolytes. Best prevention, you know, don't get it, since it's fed in fluid, um, contaminated water and foods, proper sewage and water treatment, um, you know, making sure that any water you drink is not going to be contaminated. Um, and there is an oral vaccine that if you know you'd be, <coughs> that you would be at a high risk because you were traveling somewhere where it's pretty prevalent, we do have an oral vaccine. It's short-term protection. It doesn't have any long-lasting, you know, lifetime type of uh, protection, but it's great for travelers. Our next of our Vibrios is our Campylobacter jejuni. Now, this particular bacteria is still in our Vibrio group. Um, Shape-wise, it still has that curved rod, but some of them are so long, they almost look like multiple of these Vibrios together. They almost look like spirochetes because you have a whole bunch of Vibrios all lining up together. Campylobacter jejuni is the most common cause of gastroenteritis. Now, oh, yeah, I like to break apart words. Itis means inflammation, gastro means stomach, and entero means intestine. So inflammation of the stomach, intestine, biggest symptoms, it's food poisoning. Because you're going to be vomiting and diarrhea. That's gastroenteritis, vomiting and diarrhea. It's bacteria that has to have very specialized bacteria, uh, media to grow it on, and it actually grows best at higher than body temperatures. It will still grow at body temperatures, but it likes a little bit warmer than 37 degrees. It is found in a lot of different animals, and we get infected by contact with the animals. This could be pets. It's pretty rare, I'm not gonna lie, um, that pets are infected. It just depends what pets you have. Uh, cats and dogs are pretty low cases of carriers. We usually pick it up by drinking contaminated foods, water, um, or milk, but poultry, chickens, and different other kinds of birds, so I guess if you have a pet as a bird, you're at a higher risk, um, are the top sources of where this bacteria likes to hang out. Now, what other bacteria is also found in chickens and also causes food poisoning type symptoms? Salmonella. And so a lot of people are like, oh, I had chicken, I got sick, you know, oh, it's fine, you know, whatever. Um, they are both going to cause gastroenteritis. The biggest difference is Campylobacter is worse than Salmonella because it not only causes severe diarrhea, you got seven, um, it's bloody and free, it's not just frequent, but it's also bloody diarrhea. Salmonella usually doesn't cause bloody diarrhea. Again, this bacteria is causing additional damage to the intestinal wall lining which is causes that bleeding. Worse to have Campylobacter than Salmonella, and it's the most common cause of gastroenteritis, so it is actually more cases than Salmonella. And you can have bloody and frequent diarrhea that can last for seven to 10 days. So this is not just 24 hours of, you know, well, that sucked. Um, this is like a week, and it's usually at this point, you're, you're in the hospital, because you're like, something is seriously going wrong. Um, you don't know what it is. You know, it's not getting better after a day or two. Um, and a lot of individuals, they're very affected by this excess of fluid loss. Fast prevention, proper food prep and handling, making sure foods and everything are cooked properly, washing hands. Um, I was like, yeah, depending on pets, you know, if you're playing with different pets, wash your hands before you eat something. Um, there has been lots of cases that so many people are having backyard chickens. I don't know the craze. Um, we don't. Uh, but a lot of people have backyard chickens, and yes, as if, you're, if you're exposed to those chickens, just because you get the eggs, you're at an increased risk of picking up not just salmonella, but also campylobacter as well from those chickens. And then our last, last bacteria, Helicobacter pylori. So it is a slightly helical shape, so it's still considered just that rod, but a curved rod, but it's almost like a curved rod with a little twist at the end, but it's not twisted enough that we say it's a spirochete. It's just a curved rod with a little twist. This is a bacteria that will, and likes to colonize the stomach, but it can colonize and survive in our stomach. Most bacteria do not survive our stomach. Our stomach has an extreme pH, um, acidic environment, 
Most bacteria will not survive it. This bacteria, it's like, whatever, we can handle that. And it has several virulence factors that allow it to survive in that stomach environment. It kind of has its own little monopoly to the stomach environment. Now, we pick it up, contaminated hands, well water. So this is one that, yes, it's tied to a water source. Most people pick it up from having contaminated well water. Um, or fomites, which are just considered inanimate objects, so touching doorknobs or tables or whatever, you can pick up this bacteria as well. Now, it's going to cause damage in the stomach. My next slide will go through how it does all of that. Um, but it causes inflammation of the stomach and leads to most stomach ulcers. Mm -hmm. So some of the things that allow it to survive in the stomach. It has proteins that inhibit the production of stomach acid. So I mean, it can survive in the stomach with that acid. Doesn't mean it likes the acid. It, you know, it's still a bacteria. So it tries to figure out a way how to survive it. And so it's like, well, let's just, you know, make some proteins so the stomach can't, just can't make as much acid. Two, it does have so it can burrow through the stomach lining to get away from the acid. It has adhesions to stick to the cells that line the stomach. And it has enzymes that will just neutralize the acid so they're not affected by it. So all these things allow them to survive in that stomach environment. Now, the picture that kind of shows how it's causing ulcers. So there's your Helicobacter pylori. It's burrowing through that mucus layer that lines the stomach, otherwise the acid would actually destroy our stomach. But it will burrow through that mucus because it's got flagella, and then it's going to stick to the cells that line the stomach itself. Now, it's going to produce those different proteins to inhibit the acid from being formed. It's going to produce um, enzymes to neutralize the acid, so it's like its own little yellow bubble of you know, no acid environment. Um, but as it starts to stick to these cells that line the stomach, um, it causes that mucus to thin. Now, mucus is there to protect our stomach. Otherwise, the acid in our stomach would eat away our stomach. But as these bacteria start to line it, the mucus layer becomes very, very thin wherever the bacteria are, and thin enough that the acid from our stomach gets down and starts to destroy the cells that line the stomach. This is when you now have an ulcer, is that the acid of our stomach is now eating away at the stomach lining. It's not going to feel good. Um, and the more acid that's being produced, the more it's going to irritate and cause damage to the stomach itself. Now, if that acid gets far enough and causes enough damage that it starts to get to where blood vessels are in your stomach, you now have a bleeding ulcer. And this in itself can cause, like it can cause death. Um, if it's damaged enough, you're probably going to be in so much pain before you get to that point. Um, but it's one big indication of, oh, it's not just pain, but it's like you now have blood in your stool because that blood that's getting released ends up in your stool. So damage. It's just happily living in your stomach. And the more it lives there, the more mucus it's going to thin, the more damage it's going to cause. Now, for a long time, like thousands of years, um, what did they think ulcer ulcers were caused by? Stress. It's like, oh, I have so much stress, I have ulcers now. Well, the problem is stress can cause your stomach to produce excessive acid you know, and more acid. But you would have to have the ulcer originally. You would have to have that bacteria originally there. And then the excessive acid was going to keep irritating that ulcer that's there. Now, other than this bacteria, there's really only other one cause of ulcers, and that's taking some of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, some of your aspirins, some of your ibuprofens, those things that are there as pain relievers, they can thin mucus as well, which is why they're like, take it with a full stomach, otherwise your stomach starts to hurt. Um, and because they can thin the mucus and they can lead to ulcers as well. But otherwise, it's pretty much any of those anti-inflammatory drugs and this bacteria are really the only two causes of ulcers to form. It's not by stress. Stress, 
certain foods, things like that. If you are eating more acidic foods, it's going to irritate your ulcer. Um, and it was the profound discovery. I don't remember if I've got this in one of your um, discussion board. I don't know. I'll have to look. Um, they discovered this in the 1950s uh, that they eventually, there, there was a scientist that was like, nope, I think it's this particular bacteria that causes ulcers, that he actually ingested the bacteria to study himself to get ulcers. Then he gave himself the antibiotics to make it go away. But he was able to identify the bacteria where the ulcers were. Is like, this is the definitive cause of ulcers. It's like he infected himself. Um, but he won a Nobel Prize for it because up until this, we again, we didn't treat people with ulcers with antibiotics. Why would you? You know, just we're like, oh, here's some antacids, which... Will help neutralize the acid so it doesn't irritate your stomach, um, but that's not going to actually cure you. That just kind of delays it for a long period of time um, so that it, the irritant doesn't go away. Now we prescribe them antibiotics and we've saved insurance companies like thousands and thousands of dollars just by like, here's your $10 antibiotic and you're healed. So, how we can test for it, I mean, yes, we can go based on symptoms, but that's not going to do anything. One is called a, a urease test. We're looking specifically for an enzyme called urease that this bacteria makes. Um, and one of the tests they do, I forgot all the steps in it, um, but people that have this bacteria, uh, they do produce a gas that has this particular enzyme present in it. And so there are actual things where they will have you blow into tubes and they will look for the presence of this gaseous enzyme. Um, and so it's one easy definitive test is just looking what's in your breath. Again, treatable, give you some antibiotics to kill the bacteria. And then while your bacteria is dying, they'll give you some antacids. Because again, you, you have the lesion and that acid's irritating it. So we'll kill the bacteria so no more damage can be done. And we'll give you some antacids um, to kind of help neutralize it so that your stomach can heal itself. <coughs> Best prevention, good hygiene. So in case you are touching objects that may have this bacteria, you're washing that off. Adequate sewage treatment, including you know, making sure um, that sewage is not going anywhere near well water. And proper food handling to make sure um, it's not in any kind of food or water. That's the end. Still got done a little early. <laughs>